we've got a must watch episode for you today. So we've got an all around genius, a biophysics expert from Silicon Valley, who has worked with some of the top immunologists in the field over the past many years. And he's going to bring us through the immune system and how it pertains to this current coronavirus issue and explain how it's not as people are viewing it at the moment, even the experts. So how the immune system works, how we become immune and what that means for this elusive concept, vilified concept even of herd immunity. So the only thing we'd ask as usual is you could download or stream and certainly share our extratimemovie.com website. That's extratimemovie.com, and that really helps us to continue to provide free podcasts with the best guests in the world, especially this one. So thank you. Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hey guys, it's June the 6th, and I'm coming out with another podcast with a fascinating topic and a super smart guest. His name is Creon Levitt. And he's a Silicon Valley guy, but I let him introduce himself. Creon, great to see you again. Oh, great to see you, Ivor. What an honor to be on your show. Um, been a fan for years, watched everything. Anyway, and it's, I think it's only June 5th here where I am. Uh, we're many hours apart right now. Um, and uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, I am uh, going to be talking about immunology today, but I have to caveat this with I'm not a professional immunologist, although I have collaborated with, with several of them. I am a professional applied physicist and aerospace engineer. I worked at NASA for over 35 years on a whole variety of projects, including uh, a lot of uh, molecular science which is somewhat relevant to what we'll be talking about here because we'll be talking molecular biology mostly. And I've uh, then more recent last five years, I've been working at a, a, a Planet Labs, which is a, a private uh, satellite data company who's built, launched and operates over 300 uh, imaging satellites in low Earth orbit. And your, I think your role there is kind of head of research and development or yeah, director? Yeah, technically director of R&D or chief scientist or chief technologist. Um, yeah, so I get to, uh, to do all the, a lot of the far out stuff and kind of advanced projects and, um, and also entertain all the kooky ideas that get sent our way. So I, I run what we call the kook desk uh, at my company. Excellent. And you know, you don't want to overstate it, of course. And for everyone listening, this is emerging material, an element of new science. Uh, but I think the guys you've worked with in the past, uh, immunology type people, pretty heavy hitters, uh, not amateurs. Would that be oh, no. fair to say? Not at all. I've worked with some of the most creative and best uh, immunologists in the world, in my opinion, who've made breakthrough discoveries worthy of Nobel Prizes. And so we'll see how that works out. Excellent. Well, you know what I thought, like we said earlier, I might just share the screen and switch to a simplified kind of a uh, diagram to, to zone people into what there is beyond the people who test positive for antibodies. Are there other people out there who fought off this COVID problem yet don't show antibodies? Because that would be really important. So I'll share now. Okay, so here we go. So yeah, uh, I know I, I just threw this together earlier just as a visual, but uh, we've talked to it briefly. So the unexposed population before COVID hits, 100% basically have not seen COVID. Unexposed population, then COVID comes along, and it is argued we won't get into it, but it could be a couple of months in the population spreading before it receives its signal to bloom, if you will. But we, we won't get into that. But you could say that the only people after the epidemic or pandemic has kind of mostly passed, the only people who really got immune are the people who show antibodies in these new tests. And let's say for a particular country, let's say there's seven or eight percent are antibody positive. And the orthodox opinion very powerfully uh, you know, communicated is that that country only has 7% who have any kind of immunity. Therefore, they're nowhere near herd immunity. But from talking to you and your excellent talk the other day, which I'll also link to, there's other people who may have a considerable amount of de facto or effective immunity, but not show antibodies. So I'll just show them one by one and we can briefly comment on them before we get into the science. So what do you think here, denatured or barrier uh, type people? Maybe describe that a little. 
Yeah, this is arguable whether you'd call this immunity or not, but these are people uh, who had gotten exposed to the virus and maybe even exposed to a load of virus that would have sickened other people, but because of these people's either luck or their healthy uh, metabolisms, the virus gets blocked through mucous membranes and other sorts of things, and it never actually infects their cells. Now, one might say that therefore they're not even Im mounting an immune response and they could get challenged again and perhaps infected, but some number of people who get exposed don't get the disease, not so much because of a classic immune response, but because it's just, it's just blocked through their uh, body membranes and, and, and uh, sort of nonspecific processes. Yeah, exactly. So not immune per se. But I think you mentioned earlier, it was a good point that the people who have these, I don't know, effective mucous membranes or whatever advantage they have, they're, they've got past it and they're not going to be a spreader and if it comes along again unless they get a huge viral load that's much bigger or they become sick in some manner and their membranes become damaged or whatever they're generally going to be people over the two months of a pandemic who are kind of de facto herd immunity contributors because they're not really you know developing the problem is that certainly we, we, i think what we might say is they're likely to be less susceptible certainly than the than the population that that is easily infected so this, contributors this is probably, this to is, some level yeah this is probably also a thing that gets worse as you get older you know so it's it's all mixed in with that yeah absolutely and again i'll just mention we're not quantifying these uh little segments we're saying that they exist in some manner and they need to be discussed so the second one was cleared by the innate immune system so maybe a brief a brief chat on that okay so we're going to get into more details on this later in the talk and then i have this much more detailed talk uh available elsewhere to talk about this and then of course if you dive into immunology books you'll learn huge amounts about this but the innate immune system means uh, if you're cleared using your innate immune system, that means that certain aspects of your immune system, certain antibodies and certain other signaling processes can uh, prevent or clear a viral infection, even though you've never been exposed to that particular virus before, even though you have no immunological memory, you have generic mechanisms in your body, all, well, most organisms do, certainly all mammals and even uh, plants and bacteria have immune systems and to some extent, especially in more primitive organisms, the only immune system they have is a generic system that like targets generally all bacteria or generally all viruses. And so this is not a thing where you'd have specific antibodies to a specific virus, but you have uh, signaling where virally infected cells do certain things and then the immune system, the innate immune system starts setting nearby cells into sort of antiviral modes and stuff like this. And again, the, this is a, a type of immunity which we won't discuss in that much detail, but, but some people manage to fight off the infections, presumably using their innate immune system without uh, necessarily getting sick and generating adaptive or acquired immune response, which is what we'll get into next. Exactly. So these guys uh, like these, but even more so because they really did have an immune battle they will go on to be de facto herd immunity contributors to society, but they won't show antibodies. And just to explain to people, the red X means you're not going to see an antibody positive test for either of these or the ones we're going to talk about now. Well, I would so say, the I, would say is, they, I would say oh, they, they may not show antibodies and, oh. and they don't necessarily have to show antibodies for these uh, barriers and innate systems to actually work. Exactly. So we can't quantify the segment, but there's a segment who successfully fight off with an eight who will generally not show antibodies. And maybe there are other people who have an innate response and also get to the antibody Correct. stage. But, yes. but we're just talking about the the segment that don't show antibodies yet to be quantified. Yes. Uh, then the T cells prior adapted again briefly because I know you're going to get into this in detail. Fascinating stuff. Okay, so um, one of the main routes, arguably the main route for adaptive immunity, which is the mammalian immune system that has particular characteristics that are advanced and have evolved to target particular viruses or family of, of viruses. They this is all centered around T cells and. T cells is a very complicated business. There's many kinds of T cells, but basically you, if you get exposed to a new virus and you get infected, 
you can mount a T cell response that targets that particular virus and that targets cells that are infected by that particular virus. However, you can also have previous infections from previous viruses that may have been similar enough to the virus that you're currently infected with that you have immunological memory. We've all heard about this. Like once you get immune to something, you might stay immune for years or for your whole life. You can have immunolo immunological memory that you get from viruses that are not identical to the current virus, but are similar. So for instance, there's a question of does do people who were infected with SARS-1 have some immunity to SARS-2? Were people who are infected with other coronaviruses like certain common colds have any immunity to SARS-2? And this is a new thing that new papers are coming out about. But again, you might have you may have such prior immunity from previous similar but not identical viruses and your t cell system may act to potentially to clear your body of the infection without generating a host of antibodies particularly perhaps without generating antibodies that the covid antibody test tests for because the covid antibody test does not test for all possible antibodies against COVID. It only tests for a small fraction of the possible antibodies against COVID. Um, particularly it tests against antibodies against COVID that people who've been known to be infected with COVID have. But if you were never infected with COVID but were infected with SARS-1 or something else, you might have antibodies and T cells that can fight off COVID even though they're not being tested for using these tests. This is, this is all like possible and there's new evidence coming in that it may be happening. So that's why we draw the X here. We don't know how big this wedge is. Maybe very small, maybe quite big. We don't know yet. Absolutely fair. That caveat has to be said or disclaimer for sure. But I think at the end, after we go through the really juicy science, people who stick with it, at the end, we'll talk about those papers when we revisit this pie chart. So that, that's going to be interesting. So the next one is T or even B cells newly adapted. Yeah, so this is, this is basically that if you, if you have never seen the virus before, and you mount an immune response that starts with T cells and MHC and things that we'll go into shortly, you can clear the infection from your body using a variety of different mechanisms. Your adaptive immune system invokes a host of different mechanisms in parallel to deal with viral infections. And it is not necessarily the case that it is going to activate a system that produces the antibodies that the antibody test tests for. It can, it activates a number of systems and your infection may get cleared in principle by one of the T cell mediated pathways like cytotoxic T cells that aren't tested for by the antibody test. So you might have people who are clearing the infection, even though they are mounting a wholly fresh immune response to the infection, but nevertheless test negative. Perfect. But they're immune. Thank you. I'm they are de facto, they are contributing to herd immunity in the society, but without triggering the test, which is what we were talking about here. And then there's the classic engineering false negative. And I think here you meant just people who have a very low level of antibodies below the threshold or just the kit doesn't work. You're Correct. just going to miss a bunch of people yeah. at some level. Yeah. And I mean, to be honest, we don't know, not only do we not know the size of these uh, wedges, but uh, we don't know how many of these wedges are, are X versus just partial X, if you know what I mean. Uh, but these are all possibilities. These are all different classes of immune responses that might possibly not trigger an antibody positive. Yeah, and that's, it's, a, it's a concept based in science, but not quantified. And that's fair enough. I think really it's to bring people the nuance around this, that when it's declared with certainty, like let's say in Ireland, there's only 2% people who have become immune, uh, even though the virus has run through society, it's hit saturation uh, death rates of 0.06%, and it's on the sharp decline. But it's maintained that only 2% of people were exposed. So it's more to bring up, well, hold on, there's a lot more richness in this technology going on beyond that positive test. Uh, so that's probably a fair way to summarize, do you think? Yeah, and I think we need to be a little bit humble here. You know, we really don't know mm. how much of this is going on, but new evidence has come to light over the last few days, particularly that that um, yeah. that something's going on with these green the, with these other wedges. Like, there's strong hints that um, that people who've been infected with other coronaviruses have some immunity to to SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and we, we go through, through it at the end of these papers, papers but, but one that struck me, you sent me last night was that. If I can say correctly, six out of 10 people who were known infected with COVID 
were tested repeatedly, carefully with the antibody test, and six out of 10 uh, showed no antibodies. So again, it's a small number, it's only published a day or two ago, but it'll illustrate to people, look, there's already data coming out. These wedges are unknown, and they could be very significant. So with that, uh, let's let's talk about the technology. And I think you probably, you'll share yourself, Kree, on your slides now, yeah? Uh, yeah, let me go into share screen mode and then let me, okay, do you have a full screen, colorful picture of some blobby stuff? Perfect, great. Okay, okay Beautiful. so this is something that just came uh, out in the next uh, last few days. Uh, this is not about um, COVID per se. Uh, what this is, however, is a picture, an actual picture, if you will, uh, false colored of um, a transmembrane protein. And this, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about has to do with transmembrane proteins. So as you know, every cell in your body has a membrane around it, every vesicle in every cell and the nucleus and then a mitochondria and all these things have lipid membranes that separate the inside from the outside. Every virus has a lipid membrane around it that separates the inside from the outside and studded into these lipid membranes that every living organism has are transmembrane proteins. So the lipid membrane here is shown in this light blue and the transmembrane protein is this colorful thing with all this structure. So what this is is a cryo electron microscope image of a single transmembrane protein, a top view on the left and a side view on the bottom. Cryo electron microscopy is a new uh, technique of electron microscopy that won the Nobel Prize a number of years ago. And this is the first time that an entire protein, single protein has been imaged with electron microscopy at a essentially the atomic level. You can almost see individual atoms as little blobs in this picture here. So you can see the complexity of this protein. This happens to be a receptor protein. So part of it sits on the outside of the cell and some molecule comes in and then that causes the protein to do something inside the cell. So it's a way for a signal to transduce from the outside to the inside of the cell without the actual molecule coming through. And that's a common thing. Some other transmembrane proteins do let molecules through and ions and various things and other transmembrane proteins hold things and do all sorts of things. We'll talk about that. But my point is just to get the, the architecture of a transmembrane protein. There are thousands of different wow. kinds and they're on every cell and every organelle and every virus, different ones. Okay. So, and, and, that, and that there where, where it says nano disc or the light blue, that's the cell membrane. So if people visualize a cell like a balloon, and it's got a wall around it or the membrane to keep the outside out. These actually penetrate the wall, tens of thousands of them, to bring things in and out or to present things from the inside to the outside world. And it's just incredible technology. Yes, or to transduce signals from the outside to the inside without bringing an yeah. actual thing. Um, and so this is, I mean, a whole world with thousands of careers devoted to this stuff. Yeah, NanoDisc is a, it, this is, it's a fake membrane that they've used to immobilize this protein. Uh, this is not taken from a real cell. This is taken from some kind of a special specimen, molecular specimen holder in this cryo-electron microscope. Anyway, uh, I can provide the link to this paper if people are interested, uh, but it's really beautiful. The colors are just showing different domains of the protein. The colors aren't real. This is obviously like smaller than a wavelength of light. So it has no color per se. Um, okay, so now if you, if you look at a typical cell, this is a drawing or an illustration. Here, the blue, the, the bright blue is the, uh, this is the outside of a cell. We're looking at the outside of a cell. The bright blue is, um, is uh, uh, the cell membrane, the outer surface. The, uh, the little orange uh, tree-like appendages are basically uh, polysaccharides, sugars that are poking out. Almost all biological macromolecules of interest are decorated with sugars. That's a whole emerging science that we can't get into right now that makes things much more interesting and complicated. But we can also see, here's a transmembrane protein in purple poking out of the cell membrane. Here's another one in purple poking out of the cell membrane. And presumably it's a receptor and it's binding to some small molecule that's gonna make something happen inside the cell. Here's another small molecule that may or may not bind to this receptor. Here, this sort of big spherical thing floating along this is supposed to be a, a, like an LDL cholesterol particle, a, another topic dear to Ivor's heart, literally and figuratively, <laughs> but we won't get into that. This just to show a sense of scale. But what we will get into is this MHC plus peptide. This is the central player in our story of T cells and immunology. Every, one, every cell in your body has thousands and thousands of MHC molecules, transmembrane proteins of a particular type, poking through its membrane and, and exposed to the outside. 
And inside of every one of these MHC proteins in blue, a small protein fragment is held in red. It's kind of held as if, I don't know if you can see this in the interior window, as if like my hands would be holding, you know, a small protein, okay? Or my hands might be holding yeah. another small protein. So this is, my hands here are the transmembrane protein in, in blue, and the, in this case, the, the can of sparkling water is, a, is this red small molecule. Okay, every one of your cells is decorated with thousands or more of these MHC proteins, and they're each holding small molecules. And we're going to talk about what the role of these MHCs and, these, and what these small molecules are. So here it is sort of um, schematically. Uh, in red and in blue, there's two different types of MHC. We won't get into the details. Here's the transmembrane domain, because here's the lipid membrane bounding the cell in green. Here's the transmembrane domain of the MHC. Here's the sort of the, hand, the sort of clamshell holder and the MHC. And then this little S shape is supposed to be the particular small molecule that this MHC is exposing to the outside of the cell. Or another, the technical term for this is presentation. And the technical term for this orange thing is an antigen. And an antigen is just a molecule that the immune system can recognize. Okay, so uh, this is a schematic of what's going on with a very rough picture of MHC spanning the membrane and presenting an antigen. Now, what is this? Let's look at this a little more closely. Here's a, um, like a computer rendering of an MHC molecule, transmembrane protein, presenting a small peptide. That's what they do. They present peptides. Peptides are protein fragments. So there's a side view. Here's a top view looking from the outside of the cell in. Here's the, like the clamshell hands in orange. You know, it's a simplification of the molecule. There's all kinds of atoms here that are not shown, but this is the basic structure. And it's presenting a peptide here where every atom is shown. Uh, and peptide is a fragment of a protein, okay? And here again is a different one presenting a different peptide if you look in detail. So all these MHCs are studying the outside of your cell and presenting peptides. Here's, a, here's another picture. And, the MHC is um, shown. In, go ahead. Oh, and yeah, just to, so there essentially these peptides or protein fragments are being presented to the outside world, outside the cell, to the immune system, which is swarming, I guess, like bees around all cells. Uh, but these peptides generally will originate inside the cell and be brought up to present. Well, some of, them can, some of them can originate inside the cell. Others can originate from stuff that the cell absorbs from the outside because the cell abs right. does sometimes absorb things. Um, including viruses. Um, but uh, in general, most of what your cell does or a lot of what your cell is doing and what your whole genetic code is about is making proteins. Your genetic code codes for all the different proteins that your, any cell in your body might possibly want to make. It's like the same system image in each cell, but different pieces of code are executed by each cell. But with all the code of the genetic code really is, is instructions for how to make different proteins. And so the proteins get made according to the genetic instructions and the proteins get used for their various purposes, many, many different purposes. You know, I don't know how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of proteins your different cells make at different times. Each one of them is, is, a, is each gene codes for a unique protein and the proteins are used. But in addition to the, here's a picture, the green stuff is, is RNA carrying a genetic code and the purple is a ribosome that's translating that RNA into proteins. That's a great deal of what the cell does is, is take DNA and RNA instructions and translate it into proteins using, using the ribosome. The proteins fold up into particular shapes for their particular purpose and they're sent off to the various places where they need to be used in the cell. But some amount of the proteins that your cells are making all the time get broken up into peptide fragments. That's what these little... Um, little triangles and circles are supposed to be at the bottom here, peptide fragments there. Some fraction of the proteins that your cell makes are always digested by the proteasome, broken into fragments. And then those, here it's shown, protein being digested into fragments by the proteasome. And then the fragments get loaded into these MHC molecules inside of, uh, I guess, the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi, I can't remember. And, um, and then those MHC molecules get exported to the surface. And here again, we see a schematic representation of the MHC transmembrane protein with its like little clamshell hands presenting a peptide fragment on the surface of the cell. And the point is every fragment of every protein that every cell in your body is making, every protein that your body is making 
some fraction of those proteins are broken up into fragments and those fragments are all exposed on the outside of the cell. So your cell is displaying at all times pieces of everything that it is making. Okay, now this is very important because most of the time the cell is making what it's supposed to be making, which is components that are in your genome that are supposed to be used and that your cell is working correctly. Uh, I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides, Ivor. But important point is that sometimes you get infected by viruses. Your cells get infected by viruses. So this is like a beautiful drawing by David Good cell of a measles virus. And what's a virus? It's a membrane in purple. There's some transmembrane proteins in blue that do things like fool the cell into accepting the virus into its body. And then there's genetic material, RNA or DNA here shown in yellow and DNA associated proteins or RNA associated proteins in green and a bunch of other extra helper proteins in blue. So this looks complicated and it can be complicated. There can be dozens of proteins and RNA genes in a virus, but it's much, much simpler than an actual cell. And in fact, a virus can't replicate on its own. As you probably know, a virus is passive pretty much until it makes its way into or very close to a host cell. The Ebola virus, also a David Good cell drawing. They come in, a, viruses have a vast diversity. There's actually more forms of viruses than there are all other forms of, of life combined. This is a David Good cell picture of SARS-CoV-2. Same idea. Here's the famous spike proteins in magenta. Here's the lipid membrane in pale pink. And here's the RNA and the RNA associated non-structural proteins in blue. And then a surrounding it is like some antibodies and extracellular matrix, you know, sort of it lives so, in an environment so, that's not isolated. Right. So just to paraphrase that or parse it, the purple there are the famous spike proteins that outside the virus, physical virus itself in your bloodstream could be attached to by your antibodies, let's say. Right. And that's actually shown on the left side of this picture. We see some antibodies in orange, ah. in orange that are attaching to these spike proteins. So this is one thing your body can do if it has the right antibodies to get rid of viruses is if it has enough antibodies that it can just completely surround the virus, it can, it can cause it to stop working because there's no more exposed spike protein to use to sneak into a cell. Also, once the virus is surrounded by antibodies, other parts of our immune system know that if they see something surrounded by antibodies, that thing should be digested and removed. Right. And that's the classic view that probably most people have in our current issue, that the virus itself as a, as a ball or a sphere has got identifiable proteins if you have memory and you've built antibodies and it can be attacked directly as an entity, as a virus. Yes, indeed. However, However, though, in blue is all of the machinery, the RNA to make more viruses and the virus has to get into the cell to make more of itself, which is yes. obviously a crucial step. Otherwise, if you get a thousand viruses in a sneeze into your body and they can't get into your cell and reproduce, well, there's just a thousand floating around and they go nowhere. So, yeah, I get it. Right. So. So here's another cartoon of a coronavirus, but you'll notice in addition to the spike proteins in red, there's these other transmembrane proteins in blue, orange, and yellow shown here. There's also uh, this thing called nuclear, there's proteins that are inside the virus that are associated with the nucleic acids. Um, and there are quite a number of proteins inside the virus. In fact, let me skip forward uh, once or twice through a lot of this basic stuff. Sorry, I should have... Okay, this is the SARS-CoV-2 viral genome shown in purple here. It's been quite well characterized now. Different portions of the viral genome code for different proteins. Each of these colorful sort of ribbony illustrations here is a different protein that is carried along in the, the instructions for it are carried along in the genetic code of the virus. And the virus needs all of these proteins in order to function. So a complete virus particle will have a large number of copies of every one of these proteins inside of it. Otherwise it won't function and it carries its own the code for making these proteins. Now, the important thing to note is that the spike protein is only one of these here or near the upper right, we have the spike protein, but there's plenty of other proteins that the virus needs to make in order to self assemble and to be functional and infect other cells. And 
many of these other proteins are buried inside the virus where antibodies will never see it when it's freely when they're when the virus is freely floating around but let's remember what's always going on inside of every cell in your body every cell in your body uses rna instructions to make proteins and some amount of the protein some small amount of the proteins get digested and then the fragments of the proteins get presented on the surface of the cell using mhc so what happens when a virus infects your cell? When a virus infects your cell, it fools the cell into making the proteins that the virus wants. The virus it gets its RNA into the cell, and through some steps that we will skip, the RNA replicates, and the RNA has code for all the proteins that the virus needs in order to self-assemble. And so the cell starts making viral proteins from the viral RNA. So I'm going to go back and show that. There's a nice picture of that. Here it is. Here is a viral particle. This, uh, I think, is maybe a polio virus, but it's kind of similar to a SARS virus in this respect. The viral particle fools the cell, whose membrane is shown in green. The interior of the cell is on the right. The viral particle fools the cell into accepting at least some portion of the virus into the cell. Once that happens, the viral RNA in pink goes into the cell, and then the viral RNA starts to replicate and the cell starts making viral proteins. This is an, a ribosome in purple, reading this viral RNA in pink, making viral proteins, some of which I guess are probably in blue. And maybe the cell's natural proteins are in, are in green or something like that. But the point is that eventually this viral RNA gets turned into enough viral proteins in pink of enough different types that the virus can self-assemble. Here you're seeing a virus particle self-assembling with its various different proteins that it needs to self-assemble both externally and internally, the RNA packaged up inside with the nuclear proteins, and then here's complete virus particles on the right. So this is what happens. The virus subverts your cell, and then eventually the cell starts budding viruses out from its own membranes, and then eventually the cell can become almost like a virus crystal. It can be so taken over with viruses that it just stops functioning like here, here you can even see there's so many viruses in this cell that it's almost like a crystal. The viruses have even maybe infected the nucleus here. So this cell's a goner. Okay, but the point being that any virus, in this case SARS-CoV-2, requires a whole bunch of proteins to be made by the cell in order for the virus to self-assemble and have all the pieces that it needs to be fully formed. But as I mentioned before, all the proteins that your cell is making, some fraction of them get digested into protein fragments and then those protein fragments get loaded into MHC and the MHC presents the fragments on the surface of the cell. So a healthy cell is always presenting fragments of self proteins, proteins that you're supposed to be making, protein fragments that you're supposed to be producing. If a cell gets infected with a virus, it's going to start making viral proteins, which will be digested into peptides, and the cell will now start presenting fragments of the viral proteins on its surface. Now, this is very now, important. Could I? Sure. I was going to ask a question there, and maybe to help clarify either for myself or the audience. So this incredibly complex process that's going on here of presentation, this was developed through evolution, and it's, it's incredibly complex and took a lot of work. Is its primary role generally to present non-self proteins to allow the immune system to react, even if there are no antibodies uh, and there's no spike. Is that its primary evolutionary driving force? This, this machinery was made primarily for the purposes of telling the body's immune system, hey, I'm making stuff that's probably dodgy. Is yes, that a broadly that, I, fair? I believe that is correct. Uh, we may yeah. find out that there are other purposes for the system, but this system was discovered because of immunologists doing a huge amount of work. It was all discovered. It was mostly elucidated starting when, with the AIDS, uh, the focus on HIV. Some of it was known before, but the focus on HIV really elucidated a lot of this stuff. And yes, the purpose of this system, I, here's how I like to make an analogy. If you imagine a cell as a factory and the factory makes certain things and it's really only authorized to make certain things and there's a whole your body is like a whole city full of millions of factories and every factory is only supposed to be making the things it's supposed to be making now 
if a, if, a, if a factory gets infected with a virus and maybe the factory starts making bombs, or it's not supposed to be making bombs, but the deal is all factories in the city are always, it's like they all have a, a janitorial force that's working inside the factory, gathering up little bits of everything that's being manufactured by the factory and putting it outside in special bins. And then the police inspectors are always on patrol and they, they're looking in all of these bins and they're like saying, okay, this factory is making coffee cups because we see coffee cup handles and coffee cup bottoms. That's cool. This factory is making, you know, smartphones because we see screens and this and that and the other. That's cool. And then they look in the bins for this other factory and they're like, wow, this is like explosives and timers and detonators. This factory is making unauthorized uh, materials. And then those police inspectors that have found a factory that's making unauthorized materials sound the alarm and call in all these other troops that are specialized for dealing with this kind of thing. Um, so yes, the whole system is, it appears, first of all, it, as far as I know, it only, this particular system is only in mammals and, or, or at least some of the downstream stuff we're going to talk about is, and it evolved as a way for the immune system to discern cells which are making self proteins from cells that are making non self proteins and the cells that are making non self proteins are presumed to be infected or perhaps cancerous or something like that they might more mutated they might be other reasons why it's making non self proteins and so the immune system has uh, springs into action when this is detected now i should say that um this of course we're skipping over tons of stuff here uh for instance how how is it that you don't react against self proteins what what's going on so for that we need to talk a little bit about t-cell receptors so here at the bottom of the uh, chart is let's say a, a normal body cell with its mhc transmembrane protein presenting a peptide and this could be a self peptide or it could be a viral peptide okay now there are these things called t-cells that are floating around in your body and you have a library of I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands or millions of different types of T cells. And the difference between one T cell and another is that each one is targeted to recognize a specific peptide fragment held in an MHC molecule. And they're only, the only ones that are in your circulation when you're um, no longer, uh, well, the only ones that are in your circulation during normal life are ones that target non-self proteins. All the T cells that target self proteins get eliminated in your thymus when you're very young. So you only have T cells circulating in your body that target MHC that's holding non-self peptides. And this is some details on recognition we won't talk about. Here's another picture. Here's MHC at the bottom holding a peptide. Presumably it's a non-self peptide because this T cell receptor at the top, which is part of a T cell that's floating through your body, is specifically mutated and, and, and uh, mutated is not the right word, it's a specific variant of a T cell that only recognizes this one particular non-self peptide. And by the way, this, you know, it recognizes stuff you've never seen before, like SARS-CoV-2. That's, that's a key point. Uh, I might just dwell for a moment, Creon. So these policemen, to go back to your, your analogy, which was excellent, the police coming along and they see something like looks like a timer, it's not our expected thing. It's not that it knows exactly that is an XY17 timer, like maybe an antibody recognizing a virus. It just knows it's not the right stuff and it is a non-self unusual thing. But there may be memory in the T cells of sorts, but it's not like it's specifically recognizing it. It's more just recognizing it's not right. Uh, I think actually it is specifically recognizing it. Um, oh. you have a, you, there's, it's a combinatorics game and how much of it is exactly specifically recognizing it versus approximately specifically recognizing it. Uh, I don't know that we, we know that that's just being elucidated now in the era of deep sequencing and big data and all this kind of stuff. Um, because as I said, you have these like hundreds of thousands or more different types of T cells, each that recognizes something different. So I think that there is a great deal of specificity. And so one particular T cell is going to recognize one particular fragment of, you know, SARS-CoV-2 and another particular T cell is going to recognize another fragment of 
another SARS-CoV-2 protein and another T cell is going to recognize another fragment of, you know, a, a influenza A, a particular variant, right? And so, yes, the combinatorics are quite astonishingly uh, large, but as you might imagine, you have very few T cells in your body that recognize a particular peptide fragment because there's so many possible peptide fragments from so many possible proteins. But nevertheless, you have a few if your immune system is functioning correctly, if it's not senescent, you have a few that will recognize almost any foreign peptide, specific foreign peptide, and a few is all it takes. Because what happens once this recognition takes place, and these red variable regions are what do the recognition, pretty much, of the foreign peptide. Once the recognition takes place, here we see, by the way, the MHC holding the peptide fragment in green and a T cell coming along with its T cell receptor that happens to recognize this peptide fragment. Once that binding and recognition happens, once the, a particular T cell that's tuned to a particular foreign peptide fragment comes along and sees one of your otherwise normal cells presenting the foreign peptide fragment, it, it springs into action. As I said before, if, if, the, if the T cell only sees self proteins presented, everything's cool. If the T cell sees foreign, a particular foreign protein pre presented, that particular T cell activates. And when it activates, it could do many different things. Some particular types of T cells, when they find a foreign peptide, here in, shown in green, being presented by MHC, by a, a, a body cell at the bottom here, the T cell at the top here will just send a signal to that cell to, to commit suicide. There's this thing called apoptosis, which is a signaling mechanism that cells can tell each other inside the body, particularly the immune system can instruct a cell to commit suicide. And it will do so if it sees that the cell is infected by viruses. And how does it know the cell is infected by viruses? Because the cell is presenting viral peptide fragments on its surface. So one thing T cells can do is tell us another cell to commit apoptosis. And apoptosis is very interesting. The cell commits suicide, but it's like a very orderly process. It shuts itself down and it digests all of its proteins up into fragments and it kind of releases those fragments in a non-toxic way to the intercellular environment. This is very different from a cell that like is necrotically dead, like it's been totally infected with viruses or it's been burnt or wounded or something like that. That's that's a different kind of cell death. Apoptosis is an orderly programmed cell death, and the immune system so, can tell your cells to do this. So actually, that, that's, a, that's a really important detail, isn't it? So again, just going back to the analogy, if the police see a problem, the factory is shut down in an orderly way, and all the bad bomb parts or explosives are disposed of safely. Whereas, you know, in a situation where like a cell has tons of virus and it goes out of control it just bursts or you know yeah. lyses then you can have viruses vi viable yes exactly and all, yes exactly now of course there's all kinds of an arms race going on here right because some viruses might make proteins that try and stop this apoptotic signal from being executed so there's there's a whole arms race going on here and this is all vastly mm -hmm. simplified there's many 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 more stages to every one of these processes i mean the level of quote unquote technology that's going on inside of every one of your cells is so vastly more complex and miraculous than anything humans have uh, built it's just it's not even funny it's like it's the miracle of biology it's just it the more you study it the more astonished you become that that such a thing can exist in our yeah. universe and yet it does it is incredible and you know well it's speculation at the moment but the sars covid 2 uh, virus is from the common cold family so it's got a lot of relations going back a long time but whether it can do anything beyond infiltrating the cell and getting caught like this or whether it can do advanced things like hiv and interrupt other signals we don't really know yet but one would suspect from the common cold family it may just be going through a pretty standard process without any exotic HIV type unusual stuff. What do you think? It's speculation. Oh, this is some, I, I don't know enough. I think that it's too oh. new. It's too new. You know, there's been some uh, uh, statements that it looks like SARS-CoV-2 can infect T cells. And obviously that's what uh, HIV virus does. And if you infect the T cells, you can kind of obviously interrupt this whole process. So I'm sure that SARS-CoV-2, like other viruses, has many tricks up its sleeve. But, you know, you also have to remember that if, if you can describe a, a, a willfulness to viruses, 
they don't want to kill their host, right? They would like to just replicate without killing their hosts and, or, or they don't want to necessarily li even lies the cell because now that cell is out of business for them. So there's a lot of subtleties here. Um, okay, let's talk about the, what other things the T, -cell can, T cells can do once they recognize a viral protein being presented. There's different kinds of T cells that do different kinds of recognition. I'm not gonna go into the details here, but uh, okay, the type we just talked about is a cytotoxic T lymphocyte, CD8 plus cell. It sees a viral protein being presented, and then it, this is a cell infected with viruses right here, and then it sends a signal to that cell, and that cell dissolves. That's what we were just talking about. Obviously, you really don't want this to go wrong. You really cannot have these cytotoxic T lymphocytes triggering cell death in normal healthy cells. So there's a whole system of checks and balances with a whole set of other receptors here that are just, we're not going to talk about this in detail, but we're just going to mention it. Here's, here's the MHC on top and the host and the normal cell on top. Here's the peptide fragment. Here's the T cell receptor on bottom. And then there's a bunch of other receptors on the cell surfaces of both the T cell and the potentially infected cell that have to engage one another in order to cause the signaling cascade to happen. And this has all been mapped out recently in the last few years. There's tons of receptors that have to engage one another. It's all just kind of started by this MHC T cell receptor combo. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but it, so that starts a signaling checks cascade. And balances. Yeah, there's checks and balances because you did really don't want to give the wrong signal to the wrong cell and have a bunch of your healthy cells committing suicide. And you really don't want to you know, uh, f um, fail to give the signal when you're supposed to give the signal to an infected cell. And you also have to turn it off once, once you clear the infection. You can't have all these mad, violent police running everywhere looking for cells to beat up, you know, once the riot is over. Anyway, that may be striking too close to home, but um, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. The signaling cascades inside the T cell are very complicated, and this is just to show you how some of the complexity that's been worked out over the years. And remembering each of these little glyphs and arrows is a macro, is a particular bio macromolecule identifying another one and causing something to happen. So there's a lot going on. But here's what happens, okay? Here's the basic thing that I want to point out. When a T cell first recognizes a foreign peptide being presented by an antigen presenting cell, such as a virally infected cell, once it first recognizes it, the so-called helper cell initiates a cascade which causes this tree-like expansion of a whole bunch of other types of T cells that de get derived from the original T cell. The first thing that happens is the T cell signals itself to start clonally replicating. So it makes a ton of copies of itself. And this is how like the handful of T cells that can recognize one particular foreign peptide that is circulating in your blood initially become millions and millions of T cells that can now recognize that peptide and are now circulating in your blood. And once you've got a large clonal population of that particular T cell that can recognize that particular foreign peptide fragment, they start to differentiate. They differentiate into cells that activate B cells and B cells, of which there are a number of different types, can go and eat infected cells. Again, they have specific recognition targets to notice infected cells, targets that they acquire from the T cell uh, that activates them. They have, of, um, T cells can also make other kinds of B cells that produce antibodies that are specific to the foreign peptide fragments that were presented on the surface. And we'll get back to that because that's a very important thing about antibodies that people need to know that certain other T cells can promote inflammation. And we tend to think of inflammation as bad, especially if we listen to Ivor's podcast, but, um, but inflammation is actually an adaptive response that we have evolved to fight off acute infections uh, by pathogens, including viruses. Inflammation is, is good when it happens at the right time and the right place for the right length of time. It's not good when you are chronically inflamed because you're eating crappy seed oils and uh, getting all these damaged molecules. You don't want to be chronically inflamed. Then all the time you're creating cytokines and you end up with cytokine storms if you get COVID, right? But, but you do want to have an inflammatory response, particularly against certain cells at certain times when you have an acute infection. So that's something to remember about inflammation. It's chronic inflammation that's bad. Targeted inflammation is good as long as it ends when it's supposed to and isn't active all the time. 
Likewise, some of the T cells differentiate into what are called memory T cells, and their role is not all that well understood at this point. We know the memory T cells have something to do with helping you respond much more quickly if you ever get infected again by the same virus or a similar virus, because this whole different clonal expansion and differentiation process that I've outlined takes some number of days during which time the viruses are happily multiplying and infecting new cells. So you'd like to be able to mount this response more quickly. And if you have previously been infected, you have these memory T cells and they have something to do with being able to sort of reactivate these specialized special forces troops of various sorts that are targeted against the particular virally infected cells without having to go through this long period of differentiation and clonal expansion. So memory T cells, you know, we know they're important for immunological memory, but that hasn't been fully mapped out yet, even as of this year. And then what we talked about, um, what we talked about first is the last, um, is the bottom path on this different T cell uh, mediated differentiation process where you end up making these purple cells, which are cytotoxic T lymphocytes that target virally infected cells by looking for viral peptide fragments with their T cell receptors. And when they find them, sending the apoptosis signal for the, for the cells to shut down. Again, this is totally oversimplified. There's many different types of cells that differentiate from an initially activated particular T cell, natural killer cells, all sorts of things. And this is all still being worked out. There's B cells, which have their own, which get activated from T, when, from T cells and B cells have their own really complicated signaling pathway that's been worked out. And I want to point out a fascinating thing, which is a slight tangent here, but it's just another miracle inside the infinite family of miracles that is life. And that is that y you have these stem cells. Um, I believe they're mostly in your bone marrow, but they, they're, they're always differentiating and they differentiate into all your different types of blood cells. This is constantly happening in your body. The stem cells make the, make the less uh, pluripotent stem cells and eventually they differentiate into various specialized types of cells and some of them differentiate into uh, T cells and some of them differentiate into B cells. And this is constantly happening and there's crosstalk between all these systems. So it, I guess part of the message I wanna give here is that the immune system is like the most arguably the most complicated biochemical system in your body with the exception of probably the mind and the brain and its complexity and possibly with the, and certainly with the exception of the development of the embryo into a full organism. That's even more complicated. And in a sense, this is a, a small recapitulation of embryonic development that's going on in your body all the time, unless, unless you get like radiation therapy or something like that to turn this off because obviously all this differentiation and all this replication, you know, one hair's breadth away from cancer. So these processes have to be highly regulated and this, there's all kinds of feedback loops in here and all sorts of intermediates that are not shown. Okay, so we talked a little, we're almost at the end here. We talked a little bit about arms races and so, and, and, and this has all been about T cells and the so-called adaptive immune system that recognizes very particular infected cells by the very particular proteins that they make and targets a response only against those particular cells infected by particular viruses that are displaying particular viral fragment proteins. There are many other parts of the immune system that have more generic responses. This is uh, what we call the innate system. So sometimes a virus might try and turn off the MHC presentation. Like one strategy you might think if you're a virus is, hey, I'm just going to shut down MHC production inside a cell when I infect it. And now the cell won't present anything. And now I will be able to replicate inside the cell and the immune system will never notice what I'm up to because I'm not presenting any fragments at all on the outside of the cell. But the immune system is wise to that. And if it finds cells that are not presenting MHC with peptide fragments, it puts a set of processes into action, which can signal those cells to, to shut down, okay? Also, there's parts of the immune system that can just trap viruses if you happen to be producing antibodies to proteins that are visible on the surface. And once immune system cells detect that there are virally infected cells in a certain region of your body, they will trigger nearby cells to enter what's called an antiviral state. And I don't know that much about this, um, but uh, you can imagine that 
you could tell a cell to do things like make less proteins. Just turn that down for a while. Now that's obviously a, a state that is not an optimal state. You don't want to have the cell stop making proteins because eventually it will, it will die and its old proteins will degrade. But it's probably better to have it stop making proteins or slow down the rate of protein production if that slows down the rate of viral production. So there's all these different things that the immune system can do to target virally infected cells and stop the spread of viruses that aren't specifically the T cell system that we were talking about. There's no T cells here in this diagram. Wow. So the innate in itself is, is a work of wonder in fairness. It's not to be... And the innate is interesting. The innate is shared throughout much of the multicellular animal kingdom, like, like insects and reptiles, I believe, and stuff like this. The, the adaptive immune system, I believe, is only in mammals, although there's other adaptive immune system variants that exist in other organisms. Plants have an immune system. I don't know that many details about it, but it must share some of these properties, perhaps, at least qualitatively. Even bacteria have an immune system. This was not known for a while, but it was recently discovered a few years ago, and of course, it's very famous now. It's called CRISPR. Like the whole CRISPR technology that we got was found out because people were studying bacterial resistance to viruses because bacteria get infected by viruses. Bacteria are cells, fully functional cells that are capable of finding food and, and moving out of hostile environments and replicating and repairing. And it turns out they're capable of, to some extent, fighting off viral infections in particular viruses that have infected their ancestors. They actually carry around inside the bacteria fragments of viral DNA, and then when they see that, that they're making these DNAs that they're not supposed to be making, or making these proteins that they're not supposed to be making from these DNA fragments in their library that are virus DNA, they can um, stop it. And so this the idea that even bacteria have an immune system is quite astonishing and has led to this whole wow. new technology, this whole new CRISPR technology. So I'm going to, um, let's see, we kind of already talked about this. Here's the cytotoxic T lymphocyte recognizing a viral protein from an infected cell and telling it to commit suicide. And then there's some other things that um, the T cell system can do, like make custom antibodies. Um, now, there's an important point, and I'm going to contrast the left-hand side of this diagram with the right-hand side of this diagram. On the left-hand side of this diagram, we see a virus shown here in this little circle, and we see it's covered with antibodies that are specifically tuned to bind with this virus. And this is the kind of thing that these antibody tests test for. They're looking for these antibodies that are particularly tuned for, say, SARS-CoV-2. But notice that these antibodies can only see the proteins that are on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2. So there's no, if your body makes antibodies that are targeting all these 20 or so proteins that are on the inside, that aren't shown on the outside of the virus, they're never going to do anything because they're never going to see it because they can't see inside the virus except that's not strictly true because as we know, once the virus infects the cell, the cell makes all possible viral proteins because the virus needs all of them in order to self-replicate. And all possible viral proteins are broken into fragments and are displayed on the surface of the infected cell using MHC. That includes the proteins from the interior of the virus. So T cells can recognize protein fragments from the interior of the virus, whereas antibodies to first approximation cannot. And those T cells can then initiate the various T cell mediated responses. Now, the, I'm skipping over some things here, but here's the point. The spike proteins evolve rapidly. That's how the virus evades antibodies and that's how the virus even jumps species, okay, is by mutating the spike proteins. The interior proteins, the so-called non-structural proteins and nuclear proteins, they tend to be, as I understand it, more conserved, more constant from one virus to a related virus or to a mutant. Not strictly true, of course. Everything's always changing. But those interior proteins are seen by the T cells. And now we get to the, almost the last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll go back to you, Ivor, which is this rarest of all things in this day and age of COVID uh, documentation, which is a peer-reviewed paper in a top journal 
which came out just not that long ago. I don't know, two, three weeks ago. Oh no, it came out at the end of April. Actually, it was it was accepted at the beginning of May. Okay, but nonetheless, it's Cell, which is arguably the top molecular biology journal in the world. It's an actual peer-reviewed paper, not a preprint, although it's not in its final typeset form. And um, and the title kind of speaks for itself. They're looking at the T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2, and they're also and so what they found out in this paper. It's kind of summarized by this one graphic from the paper, which is that if SARS-CoV-2 virus cartoon on the left here infects a person, and then you go look for T cells inside their body, which are sensitive to SARS-CoV-2 proteins, you will find that 100% of them have these CD4 T cells that are particularly tuned for SARS-CoV proteins. And they're tuned not only for the spike protein shown in red, but for other membrane proteins shown in purple and uh, nuclear proteins shown in yellow and uh, non-structural proteins shown in orange. And these little dashes are supposed to be the little protein fragments that are being presented by the MHC in the infected cells. So 100% in their sample of the people who'd been known infected with SARS-CoV-2 were, had T cells that were spo- responsive not only to spike proteins, but to these interior proteins as well. And then for the other type of T cells, 70% of the people who'd been infected were producing cytotoxic T cells, the killer cells that are sensitive to those proteins. Interesting to wonder why only 70% produced it. Maybe only 70% needed it and they were fine without it. Maybe those were the seven, or maybe on the other hand, those were the 70% who recovered. I'm not sure how that breaks down. But the main point of sort of the optimistic thing here is that even people who have, were verified never exposed to SARS-CoV-2, 50% of them had T cells that were sensitive to spike protein fragments, non-structural protein fragments, and other membrane protein fragments. This is amazing. People who have never been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 appear to be having, carrying around T cells that are sensitive to the, the peptide fragments that are from the interior of the virus in addition to some of the spike fragments. And they're carrying around even 20% of the non-infected people had actual cytotoxic killer cells that were tuned for certain SARS-2 um, protein fragments, including from the interior of the virus. Now, what does this mean? And there have now been several new papers about this. This means that there might be immunological memory in individuals who have never been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 that is nevertheless useful against SARS-CoV-2. How could this be? Maybe they were exposed to SARS-1, which is a very similar virus. That was pretty rare. Most people were never exposed to SARS-1. Maybe they were exposed to other coronaviruses. Well, that we know is true. Everyone has been, everyone's gotten colds throughout their life. Some fraction of those colds are from coronaviruses. So it could very well be that exposure to related viruses gives you adaptive immunity that is at least partially transferable and useful against uh, COVID. Now, this paper does not prove that it's useful. This paper just proves that it's there. We don't know that if you took these unexposed people who have these T cells and expose them to SAR, uh, to COVID, how many of them would get sick and how many of them would, would get seriously sick. But we do know, we could surmise that the ones who have the T cells would probably do a lot better than the ones who don't. So this is very interesting. It suggests that some significant fraction of individuals who've never been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 have some previous immunity, which is adaptive and specific to coronaviruses and is perhaps transferable to being active against SARS-CoV-2, even though they've never been exposed. A couple more papers also suggesting this have come out recently and Ivor has those. Okay, over to you, Ivor. Yeah, so great stuff. And if you leave that actually for the moment, just on the screen. So again, afterwards I'll attach the papers and I'm going from memory here now, but uh, first to go back to your analogy, that your body in a large number of people, maybe half the people or roughly, the police have seen this kind of thing before, right? When they look in the bins, they've seen it before. And we don't know, can the police successfully deal with the situation? But we do know that this most exotic system, you know, from previous common cold or other reasons, do recognize some of the proteins 
that will be produced when SARS-CoV-2 gets in the cell. So, but it's, we don't know to what extent that's very effective. One thing I'll add is, and I'll attach the paper, it appears that in one very recent study, I think you sent me, but buried in there, six out of 10 people who were proven infected with SARS-CoV-2, six out of 10, but they were all asymptomatic, six showed no antibody response in terms of the, with the antibody tests, good ones. So just there, it's very, you know, suggestive that if six out of 10 asymptomatics, and we know there's vast quantities of asymptomatics, but six out of 10 did not fail the antibody test, you know, it, this is going to be a really interesting area, I think. Yeah, this gets, yeah back to, I, this gets back to the pie chart. It's like, it appears that there may very well be a set of people who have, who have been infected with, with COVID, but who aren't producing antibodies, perhaps because these other immunological mechanisms, T cells or innate system or both, cleared them effectively before they started producing a lot of antibodies. And also conversely, we have this other phenomenon that a bunch of people who've never been infected with COVID already appear to have some of the immunological machinery that is partially specialized to dealing with COVID because they've been infected with homologous viruses in the past. We don't know yeah. to what extent this, these things are protective, but um, it's certainly you know, better than nothing, one might imagine. Well, and I'd suggest, again, it is speculative, and you're absolutely right, Creon, but I'd, I would think that the most exotic immunological machinery in the universe, if you will, this whole system you described, that's not the antibody system, but the whole T-cell system has been developed. And I would guess it's pretty damn effective after a million years of evolution. And we're beginning to see the data and actual evidence that it would appear that it very much could be. But yeah, the pie chart will be a great way to complete this. I'll stop my share now. No, that was superb, uh, Creon. And again, your other talk on this was even more detailed and complex. So I think this will be great for people who don't want to really go down deep, but who get the core information. So share screen and we'll pull out. Yeah, while you're doing that, let me just mention something because I want to be clear here. I mean, I am not a professional immunologist. I've never even published in immunology. I've been interested in it for about 15 years and I've been close friends and collaborated to some extent with a number of really good immunologists and have vetted a lot of this stuff with them. So, you know, I, I don't want to be too deprecating about my own presentation here, which obviously I stole all these illustrations from all over the place. So I hope that's cool. But um, uh, uh, I, I don't want to denigrate myself too much, but I also don't want to make it sound like I'm some kind of expert. I, but I've, I've vetted this presentation with a number of immunologists and, and they've all given it the thumbs up. Um, now, uh, I also uh, would like to mention that, you know, Although my other talk that you're going to reference has a lot more material, a lot more introductory material, and a lot more details as well, it also talks about the various sources that I used to, um, to learn this stuff. And you might think, uh, and, and it, for people who are really interested in this stuff, I think I've distilled some of the sources down to some really um, inspiring books. Excellent. Uh, no, very well said. But I think because you have been liaising with some of the top immunologists in the world and they have vetted this uh yeah i think you denigrated a bit too much but anyway <laughs> that's just my thought i will link the talk itself which was superb it was so superb that um and thanks again for inviting me to that zoom call to see that talk live uh, i sneakily screen recorded it and sent it to a few people i was arguing with but i will link the uh, proper high quality version exactly so that's a great point to get back to the pie, the high level view. So we've got the unexposed population. COVID comes along for a couple of months. It's getting embedded in the population until the latitude or other trigger points. That's another whole topic. But after the virus has passed through the population and we have say 0 0.06, 0 0.07% death rate and it's coming back out, People can go in and do the antibody test and they see a certain amount of people. In Ireland, now that the thing has passed, for instance, they're saying they're only around three or 4% have been exposed and have antibodies. 
but we now know that we can't determine the exact numbers or the size of the the uh, segments we know there's people who had mucous membranes or a certain degree of healthy membranes that the virus came in and just never got anywhere so no real immune response but hey they passed the virus by and they didn't help spread it so they contribute in some way to herd immunity to some extent you would say logically we've got the innate system which you went through perfectly their innate ancient system would have taken care of it they leave no antibodies for the test but they go on pass it by and become part of herd immunity group the t cells and the t and b cell systems you went through so excellently those guys won't show antibodies in the test we don't know how many of them are but from a recent paper it suggests that six out of ten asymptomatic people with known infection from covid had no antibodies so you know they, they, these could add up to quite a lot and then of course false negatives these are new antibody tests you know they have limitations and there's going to be a certain amount of people missed who do have some level of antibodies or maybe have a low below threshold of the test level so all of these even though we don't know the exact quantities they're all part of what will go towards herd immunity but we're only counting this portion that's probably fair to say what do you think Rian? yeah i'm 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 not an expert in antibody tests and I'm not an expert in how they define herd immunity. Uh, it seems to me that, that nevertheless, and also let's not be too hard on, you know, some of these uh, people coming out with these numbers because a lot of these papers that we were talking about with the T cell response to uninfected people and previously infected people without antibodies, this is all pretty new stuff. It's all within the last few days to few weeks. And so uh, it's, let me just put it this way. Isn't it going to be interesting how this thing gets uh, unraveled and and sort of if a consensus view appears in the next year, it'll be very interesting to see what it is. And when everything is factored in, Ivor, this stuff, the metabolic health component, because as we know, you know, you might quote some uh, fatality rate, but that fatality rate then takes on, in my opinion, a whole different tone when you realize the vast majority of the fatal cases are people who were previously ill with metabolic disease, which you've devoted your recent career to turning around metabolic disease in the community. I mean, one might argue that if people, if everyone had been watching your podcast for the last two years, we would have never noticed SAR, uh, never noticed COVID because these people wouldn't, wouldn't be unhealthy anymore. Most of them, but uh, that's, let's hope that moves forward. Yeah, I don't know about what I can have offered, but thank you, Creon. But yeah, certainly if everyone was, you know, high vitamin D status, which reflects low inflammatory or chronic inflammatory issues and reflects many other things and had low leptin resistance, were insulin sensitive, even people in their 70s or 80s who are very insulin sensitive and in great metabolic health, you know, they may have a risk lower than a 50 year old type 2 diabetic. And I just saw in the UK press there, this afternoon actually that they're talking about over 75s and particularly with issues uh, this figure seems crazy or something like a thousand or ten thousand times more at risk than under 30s or under 40s so it just yeah exactly it's a huge deal but you're you're absolutely right that this is new science so in fairness even immunologists uh, who may be really focusing very much on this as you say, it's only in the last couple of weeks that this is getting quantified. So in fairness, you can't really blame people for not being all over this like a rash, as we say in Ireland. But we will see in, in the coming 12 months. Yeah, it'll be very, it'll be very interesting. And um, uh, I have some other speculations we could uh, talk about another time about what we might end up seeing when, when this happens. But yeah, I'm particularly, let me just mention one thing. I'm particularly interested if if we ever get data where we can really factor out all the metabolic disease, like if we, if we can, you know, and if we define metabolic disease widely enough, like to include insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance and um, hyperinsulinemia and, you know, elevated CRP and all these things that we should probably include in metabolic disease states, not just official diabetes and official uh, obesity and things like that. If we include all that 
stuff in our umbrella of metabolic disease. And then we take the different age groups and we pull out the diseased people and only leave the metabolically healthy people in every age group. Are we really going to see this, this increasing seriousness with age for COVID? Or are we going to find out that most of the higher risk that comes with getting older is because older people tend to have more metabolic disease. I'm really curious how much of that is a confounding factor. And if we were just looking at healthy people, would we really see that older people are more at risk? I have no idea, but it will be interesting. It would indeed. And I've thought that for, for quite some time now. So this curve with age that's extreme for death rate, that if you're below 60, it, we'd hardly see it in a sense. If, if what you said happened, I think that you'd still have older people more susceptible, maybe in general, but the curve would go from an exponential right down to just a slight tail up for the older, I would guess. And yes, the absolute number of deaths and impact overall would be enormously lower. So I think so. But we'll, we'll circle back on this uh, when more data comes out in the next few weeks. And uh, it's going to be fascinating. So this has been fantastic. I was riveted last week on your presentation. I'll attach it here. And I think this is great because it's brought it up a level and get it out to more people. So thank you so much for this. Well, thanks for having me, Ivor. It's always been a, a, an ambition of mine to get to spend some time with you. And I've really appreciated it. Oh, the honor, honor and the privilege is all mine. Thanks, Grio. We catch you soon. Catch you soon. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen and go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.